So Steve, if I could, um, you've obviously had a, a long trajectory of uh, recognizing problems and production processes and going and searching out solutions, not finding them and deciding to build your own. Uh, what were some of the biggest challenges that you faced when looking at something like Serum as opposed to a smaller sense, now you're taking on this massive challenge. What were some of the bigger ones that popped up? Um, well, I, I mentioned the, probably the biggest one to me, which was, was the quality issue on the oscillator playback. That was like a hurdle to me, so just something I had never done. Uh, I had sort of taken kiddie steps through the software, like I mentioned early on. I talked about my first foyer into software with the bit reduction and, and using three lines of code to have bit reduction visualized. So from baby steps like that to get to something like this, um, having oscillator playback, in other words, have that visual, that that chunk of green audio we see there loop around, um, you need that to sound good at all frequencies. So in other words, if I play a low note on the keyboard or I play a high note on the keyboard, I want it to sound good. I don't want it to sound like weird and artifacty and, and not like you would expect it to. So that gets into some math that I, I hadn't really ever um, pondered before. And it's gained me some insight onto how this stuff works and, it's, and, it, and a lot of it ends up making sense if you think about it from a logical perspective. You don't really need to go deep into the math yourself, although if you really want the best result, you're going to at least need to know someone that does. Um, so the funny thing with programming is actually it isn't as math heady as people might think. It's really just a lot of logic. And I don't consider myself like a, a software engineer, ultimately. I, I'm more of a software designer that just happens to do all the coding because um, I feel like I could do it better myself. Uh, early on, when I was just really considered myself more of a musician producer, and I was feeding ideas to other software de developers, I would have to wait a long time to ever see that thing get manifest. So I decided that I wanted to, to have a faster turnaround of being able to see something ha happen and take it upon myself to do it. So I think the biggest one with Serum was ultimately, uh, in terms of like a technical thing, was the oscillator quality. Uh, I mean, there's some other boring things that came up for me that I'd never quite experienced before, which was like some threading issues. Uh, basically, you have, you have simultaneous processes going on on the computer, one that's doing all the graphic stuff you see, and then one that's doing all the audio that you hear. And obviously, these two things need to talk to each other, both directions. And bad stuff can happen if you're trying to change one from the other at the wrong time. In other words, if I'm drawing to change the sound of the oscillator here, but you're playing back the oscillator, that can cause problems. So you need to wait until it's safe to update what you're hearing. Uh, before you just go ahead and try to change it. Because if you go ahead and try to change it, then it's going to be trying to play where nothing is, and it's sort of like you know, taking the road away from your car that's driving or something like that. It's, it's going to lead to unpredictable behavior. Um, so yeah, I learned some threading stuff. I hadn't had to deal with like threading synchronization, stuff like that. Um, I just managed to get away without it previously. Um, but for the most part, it's, it's all like baby steps. It's, it's one of those things like going on like a, you know, a, a long hike up a hill and you look down at the city below or whatever and you go, I can't believe we walked all this way. But it wasn't really that hard to walk all that way. You just did it. You just, you just went off your way. And so I think that's how a lot of things are. Um, you guys probably know that from working on a big song or a project or something and you, you just get tunnel vision. You go in at it because you're having fun and you're digging it. And then you zoom out on your project or whatever. And you're like, oh my God, look at all those edits I've done and look at all that automation graphs. And oh my God, there's so much going on. Um, but it's not, it's, it's never really overwhelming because you're just kind of in the moment, enjoying the moment, doing one little thing at a time. Uh, but Serum also did become a little bit of a, a monster to, to finish all of those edges because I built it leaving kind of like, you know, holes open, like things weren't finished. You know, things were looking ugly here and there, and I'd add another feature while this other thing's still not done. And so I had a lot of loose ends that needed tying up. And that got a little bit of a dark, I got in a little bit of a dark place after about two and a half years on the project going like, I don't know if this thing's ever going to get finished. I don't, you know, I don't see the light at the end of the tunnel. Am I ever going to, am I crazy? Am I going to see these two and a half years I've spent on this like back as income? Or did I just, or am I just going to be bankrupt, literally? Am I going to be able to, you know, pay my mortgage? Um, so I really, I really went to a dark place a bit and it wasn't, I'm not, you know, I didn't get all emo really. I just started getting concerned. Um, but then uh, things quickly after that shaped up, I just, sort of put my foot down with deadlines, got my beta, beta testers on there. They helped kind of nudging me into a to-do list of things I need to fix. And of course, the 1.0 ship still with bugs because your beta testers aren't perfect and none of them have a Russian name or whatever it is that's going to crop up. <laughs> but yeah, so still ship with bugs. But that's the beauty of software too, is that it's soft. It's updatable. There's, you know, there, was, there was quite a few crashes and problems with the 1.0 version actually. But now I'm finally with the version I put up yesterday, uh, 1.03, it's finally at a place where I feel like it's 
quite stable and it's really, really, I don't know a way to make it crash right now, which I'm pleased about. Um, so that's good. Um, but yeah, I think that answers your question. Hopefully. A quick show of hands. Who already owns Sierra in the room? <laughs> Thank you. Um, you guys have any questions for Steve at this point? Like Serum users? Yeah. Liam, go ahead. Yeah, just uh, what did you code Serum in? It's all C++. So every, pretty much everyone uses C++ in audio field because you need to be kind of low level. You can't be in like some interpreted language that's doing stuff runtime that's not efficient. Uh, because CPU use, of course, is the, is the killer, and that's what everyone's worried about. So I have uh, good old Xcode here. This is actually my OTT plugin that um, I've been working on. It's like a freeware copy of the Ableton OTT compressor. Um, I've just been adding it because I've Zed and uh, David Heartbreak, some friends of mine, want this want the ability to change the band depths like you can do in the... Um, I better not touch them, I'm just going to crash right now. But yeah, the, uh, so I'm just adding that where you're going to be able to drag these and set the threshold and stuff like that independently for each band like you can in the real one because those guys use Logic or, or uh, Cubase or whatever, so they, they want to be able to get that sound. Um, and so I have that for free. I have some free plugins on my website, which is xforrecords.com slash freeware. It's not, it's not accessible through the main page, but if you go to slash freeware, um, you can find some free plugins there where I have this OTT and this uh, few others, a dimension expander and uh, whatnot. So... Anyway, yeah, that's, um, hope that answers the question, because I just forgot the question. It was a uh, coding language. Oh, right, C++, so there you go. And, and how did you go about learning C++? Was that something else you just taught yourself? Yeah, I learned, I learned by examples, right? So rather than reading a book and understanding all the theory and what, what a type class, data structure, any of this stuff really was, um, I just dove into it by looking at the examples like a Rosetta Stone almost, of like, okay, I know what, the, I know what this does as a result, so let me look at the bones that make it up. And I just sort of through osmosis would look at that stuff until I could kind of make sense and imitate it. So if I was stuck trying to do something, I would think of where is an open source example of this being done that I can look at and I can see how they did it and then I can implement that myself. So even to this day, because I just haven't internalized everything because it's sort of like a top down versus bottom up approach, I guess, I still need to sometimes look at examples of oh, how do I declare a class or something that would be like a joke to a college student that studied computer engineer, you know, computer science, but but to me, I just, you know, I, I know the syntax just well enough by looking at examples. So it was really just a baby steps thing. Take the example plugin and start making it do things it's not supposed to do. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I mean, you made the plugin, so you obviously know this thing like the back of your hand, but has, have you or any users done anything with it so far that made you go like, whoa, I didn't know it could do that, you know? Um, Yes and no. Um, I, I feel like I know its potential limitations. I mean, obviously, like I know that given the, the, the type of synthesis that it has, that it's not going to say do a convincing Steinway grand piano or something like that. You're just not going to be able to do it because to do that, you're going to probably want some very advanced physical modeling if you actually want to try to synthesize the sound. Or you're going to do what most people do is just record a Steinway grand piano on every key with a bunch of different velocities. Um, so that's the easiest way to get a realistic sine wave out, right? So you're not going to get that out of Serum um, because there's no multi-sample ability even. Um, you can do some tricky stuff though, and I've been mildly impressed with, you can simulate kind of format shifting by using like some of these uh, PWM or, or sync modes where you're pushing the waveform, stretching it, pinching and pulling it. And so when you do that, you get sort of like a format shift. So you can, you can apply that to say the note graph here. So I could drag note to there. And now for the different note I play, it's going to have more or less pinch like that, right? So a low note might be down there, a high note might be up there. So you can actually do things like a piano might do or, or get this sort of format shifty stuff. So you can almost simulate that. So I've been a little impressed with some of the presets people have made in that manner. And there's, um, there's a new library out by Plugin Guru. Uh, it's like uh, PluginGuru.com. And so he has like a, it's called like Mega, mega evil, mega epic. It's basically like two packs. There's like an epic sort of like progressive sounds and then evil like dubstep sounds. Uh, so you can buy either one or both as a bundle or whatever. And those are really cool. Like both of those guys have done good stuff. In fact, Seth Norman, one of the designers uh, of that bundle with Plugin Guru is, uh, he did a dubstep demo, which was the first thing I heard like 100% serum that made me go, oh wow, like it's got a lot of cool sounds going on. Uh, very, you know, it was dubstep kind of a demo. So that's somewhere on the Extra Records Facebook. You can find that Seth Norman demo. If you go back near the release of Serum. Uh, anyway, the, um, the Plugin Guru guy is doing another library next, which is all based around the noise oscillator. So the noise oscillator is like a high quality sample player. 
Um, it sounds better than most sample players will, like loading in a sound and stretching it around the keyboard. Um, so it's, it's just lo lower aliasing, basically, so cleaner. Um, so he's doing a library by bringing in his own sounds, because you can actually put your own sounds in here. You can go to like a show serum presets folder from menu there. It takes you on your computer to your pre serum presets folder, and then you can put samples into the noises folder here. Uh, you can make your own folder or whatnot, or put them in user. Um, and then next time you reopen the plugin window, those will show up here in the menu. So he's building a library with just like sounds he's made on his modular synths or whatever it is, just his own like bank of noise sounds. And then he's building patches, including of course the other oscillators and the filter and effects and all that. He's building that all um, uh, sort of with, with the noise oscillator being the heart of the sound. And so it's really, like the stuff that he sent me is really cool, like uh, not what I expected because obviously the sound can be anything because it's a sample. So some of it just sounds like stuff like, oh wow, I didn't expect to hear a sound like that out of Serum. Um, so in terms of impressed me, I think that would be it. So, uh, yeah, go ahead. Do you have any advice on like, creating a really clean and crisp sound? Clean and crisp? Yeah. yeah um, I do think, well, first and foremost of Serum as clean and crisp, so to sort of just like toot my own horn, I guess you could say, um, I could give you an example of, of that if you want to see it in a visual. Um, I've done this in a, in a, in a still image on my, on my web page as well, but basically the idea is that um, you can take a very basic sound, let's say a sawtooth. And a sawtooth is a great one for, for demonstration um, as well as to get a crisp sound because a sawtooth contains all harmonics. So, so if we take a saw and we play that back, and what I'm going to do is just kind of turn down the volume because we don't really want to hear that too much. Um, so I have Massive as well as just like our control experiment. And Ma Massive actually is really quite good oscillator, so I'm not doing this to say anything bad about theirs, but just to use it as sort of a control in the example. Um, so I'm going to pick a sawtooth in Massive. Um, and then, uh, so we've got a saw here and a saw there. Um, I've done this with the exact same saw, but this saw in Massive is, is a perfect saw. There's nothing about it that's not really. Um, now we can go to a spectrum analyzer. So in place of our ears, um, because it would be not too much fun to listen to, but um, we, can, we can see it with our eyes. So I have, now I have um, Serum and Massive here, and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to key map um, a key so that I can toggle between the two mutes. So this is something I do all the time. I do this with mixing. It's a, it's a little trick of mine. I don't know if you guys are Ableton users or care about that, but it's a, it's a handy trick, which is just to key map two things to the same um, key and then just set their states opposite. So instead of both off and both on, you set them toggled. That way, every time you hit the key, they both toggle, and you're able to A, B that way. So um, I'm just going to put monitor in on both so we can... So now a MIDI note, when I play a MIDI note, it's going to play both synths, but I can toggle which one we're hearing. So now I just need to bring Massive's volume up because they have the volume decays down there. So you can see switching between them sounds pretty similar. The higher the note you go, the more you're going to run into digital aliasing, which is an artifact that happens from uh, trying to reproduce frequencies that are higher than we're able to. Um, so there's, in sampling theory, there's something called the Nyquist limit. And so the Nyquist limit is half your sample rate. So basically Nyquist theorem says you can create any frequency up to half your sample rate. So at a 44.1 sample rate, there, our Nyquist limit is 22.5 kilohertz, which happens to be the exact end of the spectrum signal. You guys probably can't see those numbers, but it goes up to 10K there, and then the next doubling is 20K there, and then that's 22K. So that's our, that's our Nyquist limit right on that edge. So if we tried to produce a frequency that's higher than that, we're going to get artifacts, and they're going to be ref reflections or unwanted, sig unwanted frequencies that are going to reflect or bounce back uh, into the audible spectrum. So uh, if I play a low note, it's not necessarily quite as much of a problem because all the harmonics are decaying down, and by the time we get down low here, anything that's going to reflect down more, plus all the harmonics get closer and closer together. So the spectrum is so crowded with all these harmonics that are close together, you're not going to even notice these quieter ones bouncing back the other way. However, the higher the, the frequency that you reproduce, the more it's going to start becoming an issue. So this is where I'm just going to take the master down because nobody likes high frequency notes. Um, so now I'm up here at, say, one kilohertz. And so if we, um, oh, let's not do that. So if we're here at one kilohertz, um, oh, I knew I was going to do that. Well, it's not that bad. That's good. So here's massive. And you can see the Nyquist reflections. So there, we're on ultra mode in Massive, and ultra mode is going to probably be oversampling. So they're art, sort of artificially extending the Nyquist limit by doubling it up. So now the Nyquist limit is probably 40, 44K. 
um, as you can see. Well, you can see some funny reflections right there. Um, and then you can see all of these reflections here. And they notice that they go below our fundamental. Our fundamental is here at 1K. And we're getting these sub-frequencies that we don't want. And they're not that loud. We can't really hear them. But if we started adding distortion and multiband compression, something like that, those are going to start getting brought up more and more into the audible realm. And they're just clouding our mix with these frequencies that we don't want. Um, in, so there's massive, there's serum. And so it's cleaner. Some people are like, swear they can hear the difference. I can hear the difference. Does it, can you hear the difference in a song? Probably not. You know, it's, it's, does, it, does it matter? Not necessarily, but again, I wanted to make sure mine were the cleanest. But visually, you can see a huge difference, right? This is serum, and you can see there's no funny things between these harmonics. They're unmassive. You get this odd ringing phenomenon. If you can hear 20K, you might hear those. These are quieter down there, but they're present, and you can hear them. They're, they're faintly kind of cloudying up the, the signal, but they're, they're down at the threshold of acceptability in the context of some noisy drums going on. You probably wouldn't hear them. But that's just the example of, like, of, to me, of what I consider clarity is, is it's, it's, it's what you don't hear more than what you hear that makes something clear. Uh, it's the absence of junk, right? So um, I think of that as that. And so serum is a good one for that because there is nothing that you, you know, it's all the stuff you want and none of the stuff you don't, essentially, uh, on the harmonics. Um, so, but to answer your question in more of a creative way, it's, it's a, Creating space is kind of what I'm all about, and, to, and clarity and crispness, I mean, both those are slightly different in my mind. I mean, using English or using words to try to describe sound in music is always a little funny, but, um, but, but for me, crispness has to do with the high end being um, defined and tight, and then um, and clarity, and both of those words, too, have to, have to do with intelligibility as well. So it's something I go for with vocals in particular when I'm mixing a track or anything that I fe feels like a lead or featured instrument. It's important to make sure that the intelligibility is there. So I'm removing the unwanted parts of the sound. Um, is generally how I'm thinking is more in a destructive sense rather than constructive, right? So rather than taking someone's vocal track and trying to add stuff to make it better, I'm thinking about pulling out stuff to make it clearer. So I, I try to find where there's excess. And, and I think about this way uh, in a lot of different scenarios with mixing music is what can I afford to get rid of? Uh, so is there, is, can I afford to make this sound shorter? Can I afford to make this sound just overall quieter? Can I afford to take out some low mid-range in this or that? Um, because if you want, I don't know, it's, it's, it's hard to generally, sort of a sidestep maybe from the question, but generally when people hand me a, a song and they'll give me st stems in a rough mix, right? And so I call up the stems, I call up the rough mix, hopefully they don't sound too different. Um, so I'm listening to the stems and or rough mix and going, hmm, okay, so I listen to that, and then I hit stop. And, and this is sort of like, it's just a habit of mine. I'll hit stop, and I'll let the room go to silence, and there's no one there, so it doesn't get too weird. And, um, and then I think in my head about what I just heard, and not, cr not critiquing it, but rather trying to imagine how would that be awesome? Right, I just heard that. That's like the the reference, right? How, how would that just like, just trying to imagine it coming out of the speakers and just kicking my butt? Like, oh my God, that is rad, right? So, obviously, I can't change the notes. I can't take away their stupid melody or or whatever it is that I don't like. But how can I put that in the best light possible? How can I just make that sound the best? So, a lot of that has to do with relative placement of different things. In other words, they can't all be loud. Certain things are going to have to be quiet, which will make the other ones that are loud feel even louder. And um, dealing with the fact that a song, like music is a temporal art and we're going through time. So at any slice of time, um, something can be a certain volume, but that doesn't mean it has to be that volume the next slice. So a lot of the time what I'm doing is with events and with parts, I'm making them emphasized at their start, and then I bring them back into a sane place. So if your lead synth enters, I'm going to push you up in a little too loud. If I left you there, it would get really annoying really quick. So as, almost as soon as it gets up loud, I'm bringing it back into the mix. What that does psychologically is your ear and brain will follow it down into the mix, but still thinks of it as loud. So you've um, basically prevented it from sounding like everything else is too quiet, because that's what kind of happens. It's, it's one and the same, right? If your lead is too loud, it makes it sound like everything else is too quiet. 
And then obviously the mistake would be to try to like also turn up your drums when the lead comes in and also turn up this when your lead comes in because now you're just crowding your headroom and everything's just going to get kind of crushed. So rather, I try to just create space. I mean, I start, I start my uh, mixing with, with bringing everything back essentially quieter besides the things that just need to be loud. Um, if it's a house kind of track or anything that just r survives on the kick drum, the kick drum gets to go to unity, gets to go up to full code zero, and then everything else is mixed behind it. And that just prevents the kick drum from ever like getting stepped on too much. But at the same time, I have to be very sensitive that that kick drum's not taking up any too much space. So I need that clarity to be there for other instruments. So a lot of it is just carving space to make things fit where they can more naturally. If a vocal's intelligibility isn't there, I don't really want to boost the mid-range on the vocal because now the vocal's going to sound however you want to describe it, tinny or mid-rangey. Um, so I'd much rather try to scoop out mid-range that's competing with the vocal that's making that clarity not be there. That way the space has been carved for the vocal or, vo or volume-wise or automate stuff to come down when the vocal comes in or put a compressor with the sidechain source as the vocal. So every time the vocal happens, that other sound gets pushed back automatically. And between the words, that sound comes back up. So I'll do a lot of that kind of a thing too, um, to sort of, instead of trying to automate the two back and forth, just let a sidechain compressor do it with the vocal as the source. Um, so all these things are just to, to uh, add intelligibility, uh, which to me is hopefully crispness and clarity, um, by just making sure things aren't stepping and competing and allow um, it's kind of a high contrast thing, right? Like allow certain, the, the things that need to be the brightest and the loudest, let them win the war easily. Um, sort of like a metaphor, or what, that's probably not the right word, but what I, well, one thing I think of it as is um, if you're having dinner with a friend in a restaurant and they're talking and the restaurant's loud and you're doing a lot of work with your brain to like drown out all these other conversations and you're trying to hone in on the words they're saying so you can understand what they're saying. And it's kind of annoying. And you might, not, you might not realize that right away. You might be sort of like listening to your friend and you're, you're kind of annoyed, but you don't, it hasn't really entered your conscious mind that you're annoyed trying to listen to your friend, but you're, you're having an uncomfortable experience. And music's kind of the same. A bad mix is going to be this uncomfortable experience for the li listener because the listener just wants to know the words and they're being annoyed that they can't because you have your lead synth that's like, they've already figured out the notes of that in the first time they heard it, and now it's just in the way of the words that they want to understand, or whatever it is. So um, the most important things need to be um, high contrast. They need to be clearly made most important, because the listener wants to be guided through the song and shown the highlights. They don't want to have to try to figure it out for themselves by you putting all 12 parts like equal volume and go, go to town, listener, and, you know, enjoy decoding this. They don't want to decode it, just show me the good stuff guide me through the song, like show me the, the highlights. Um, and so that involves sometimes a fair amount of automation, but it involves mostly just a hierarchy of level balance. Mixing is 95% about level balance and you can do incredibly good mixes. In fact, I was teaching a mixing class at a production school in LA and, and I would say, and it sounds maybe a little egotistical, but I'd say I bet I can beat most of your mixes with no plugins. Like you can use everything that's out there, everything that's available, and I'll just use faders. And I bet I could get a better sounding mix than your mix. Because yes, experience, obviously in ears, but it's that it's really mostly about the levels. And if you start getting distracted by these compressors and multiband this and all that, you're gonna start forgetting that it's really about making sure that you have the right foreground, middle ground, and background, and that the important stuff is not getting stepped on by the annoying uh, unimportant material. People want that information out of it. And yes, they want to be impacted and they want it to sound big in the right way and big at the right time. And so you do just trust your ears ultimately. You don't want to just use logic and reason to like, you know, head your way through the thing. Um, but ultimately, uh, ultimately, it's good to always, I always keep that as a guidepost of what matters now in the song. What's the thing that people want to listen to? What's the most important? And I just try to put that in the best light possible. Everyone else is a supporting cast member. Figure out how they can fit in without getting in the way of what's most important. Yeah, go ahead, Fermo. Um, you've spoken about carving out things over time spectrum. Yeah. Uh, I was hoping you could speak uh, to frequency and how you sum things and how you bust things. Because uh, I find myself using a lot of notch filters and then when I set them to the bus and I compress them, there's just how much the glue. Yeah. Well, stuff like notches are, are a little 
little dangerous. Um, if you're using them like automating notch filters for some sort of narrow effect or something, yeah, of course, go to town. But if you're using them really as some, a mixing tool, that can be a little dangerous because you may be correcting, compensating for your personal ears or your room or your speakers. Um, you, you would know better than I. I mean, it's a case by case basis. There may be times to use notches. I don't personally use a lot of them. I'll notch out something if I hear a specific frequency peak that I don't like, right? Like a certain ringy tone in something that I feel like that's not important musical material. That shouldn't exist in the sound. Oh, there, now it's much better. I mean, I've had kick drums that have a little doo -doo or something in it, and I'm just like, it's not in key, like someone's just, why is that there? So I'll just find that note by just creating a bell, right, that's making it extra loud, and once you hear it like ringing like mad, then you take it out. I'll do that, but I won't de facto ever use a notch otherwise, because all of our ears are incredibly wild in frequency response, and so you may be just doing something that, that for you is compensated. That's just something to keep in mind, that we all have wildly strange frequency responses, um, and we all actually perceive sound really different. My dad's actually, uh, uh, retired now, but he's an audio cognitive researcher. So he he did stuff with um, binaural audio, and he and he was doing more extensive testing than anyone ever done with like dummy heads and sending different frequencies to see how uh, the frequency response changes with different azimuth and elevation. So it was really for three D audio stuff where you could um, you know you had a circuit board, we could turn. He's like put on the headphones, and he had like Beethoven playing or something. He's like turn the knob, and you turn the knob, and the sound goes up, like you, it literally just sounds like the sound's going up above you. And, uh, and this stuff doesn't work for everyone. Like, you, there's basically, he found there's basically three different models that different people would, would, would adhere to because we all have different notches based on the shape of our ear and the size of our head um, that we will use as our reference for if a sound is up above us or whatnot. So it might be four and a half kilohertz for me and it might be five and a half kilohertz for you. So it's good to keep that in mind that it's a little frustrating because it's almost one of those, I wonder if we all see green the same color or something. But, but, it, but we are all slightly different, so there's no reason necessarily to go too surgical. At least I think it's not the big problem of the mix, or if that is your big problem, you must have an amazing mix kind of a thing. But yeah, if you hear some ringy thing, I would go for it. Um, as for carving out frequencies otherwise and bussing and that kind of stuff, um, I don't have too much of de facto rules there. One thing that I generally will do is take all drums but a kick drum and bust those together. Um, and the reason that I'm mainly doing is that so I can put those in a box dynamically. So I want my drums to typically go between here and here. In other words, I don't want them to generally fade to black. I don't want, I'm generally not having drums that go to total silence. Um, but I'm not too worried about this, the quiet side of things as much as the loud side of things. So I generally want some sort of limiter or wall put on so that I can get all of these drums to be in their place. And it's really just that. It's really just me being like a, a lion tamer or whatever, just getting it so like that's where you live and that's where you exist. Um, and it's not terribly necessary. I'm not doing that really to make them fat or anything like that. Although there has been times definitely where I'll, I'll put some sort of coloring on the whole drums just to try to give them their place in a way so that they feel like they all belong together. But that's really if I'm coming from a place of intent where I feel like I want the drums to all feel like they coexist in a place. Usually I have the kick drum, once again, outside of this whole bus. So it's, the kick drum's just doing its, whole, its own thing, which is generally loud and proud. Uh, and it really depends on your genre of music, too, and that kind of a thing. You may want kick on its own, snare claps on its own, and then maybe all hi-hat percussion, all this stuff would be this bus that's all glued and tamed together. And or you may want the, kick, the snare and claps or whatever as part of that group as well. Really sort of a case-by-case -case basis and hard to like talk about this stuff in a blanket term. Uh, in uh, frequency stuff otherwise, um, you know, the low end is the most important thing to get, to get cleaned up, I think. Um, the, if I can, yeah. a specific example that like, uh, I deal with often is having my bass line collide with my kick drum. Right. And so I'm wondering, I, I guess I don't really have a good solution to separate those other than just taking a notch out of the, the bass line where the kick drum is. Got it, right. Well, and a good thing to understand is that you can't really, um, you can't really, I mean, my rule of thumb with it is, is to first assess the song and the musical situation because I don't like rules that are just gonna be something that's always for the, all music and all genres, right? So my, my thesis or rule would be that you can have a big kick drum or you can have a big bass sound, but you can't have both, at least happening simultaneously. And so there's sort of physics reasons for that, so to speak, which is phase, phase cancellation. Um, if they're the exact same frequency, like people say, oh, I tuned my kicks or whatever, and then you have your bass. Well, all you're doing in that case, in an ideal situation, is that you're lining up the two 
fundamentals or sine waves, right, to be exactly on top of each other if they're in tune, in which case your ear is not hearing two anymore, right? It's just one loud thing. But there's a good chance that on other timings or notes, now they're canceling, and now you have zero if they were the same volume and lined up. So it's going to be really phasey and weird. Uh, ultimately, you really only want one fundamental at one given time. An example would be here. Um, this is sort of a, not the best visual of it because they have to go up high, but um, I'll do it with some lower harmonics and hopefully that'll make sense. You could imagine that's like the frequency of your kick drum. And then your bass might be near that. Um, well, let me hide the kick drum, right? So here's my bass, right? It looks pretty similar, right, to this. Should be my kick drum. Same idea. So if you have both, look what happens when they add together, right? You get this cancellation taking place where you get this warbly, as the volumes start approaching equal, they start getting warbly. And depending on the phase, that's going to be a different kind of warbling or cancellation. And the problem is only going to get weirder and better and worse if one's like changing pitch and the other one's not changing pitch. But we no longer have this solid low end. And the chances are you just really want a solid low end. And for me, it's back to the, what you started the question with, the first question, which was time. Right? How do I want the low end to happen over time? Imagine yourself sitting on the subwoofer or imagine yourself right outside the club or whatever. How do I want these, or in the club, in the sweet spot of it all with the best sound system known to mankind, right? How do I want this low end to shake my rib cage? What do I want to have happen? Do I want waves of bass? If I want waves of bass, that means there needs to be these moments without bass in order for the wave to happen. So this is why I'm shortening my kick drums, like I said earlier, all the time, because I want to hit people with this wave of low frequencies. But I don't want it to always be there. It reminds me of uh, early on when uh, Dead Mouse was starting to just get into his rhythm, and he had done this track with Melly Fresh called Hey Baby. I think, it, I think that was the track. It was one of the ones with her um, early on. And I was at a club called Pasha in New York, which is a great sound system. And the DJ played it, and there's all these tracks before it, and all these tracks after it. It was all like kind of mostly house electro stuff. And then his track came on, and all of a sudden, it sounded really bad, really, because it was like it was just this wall of low end. Instead of this like, ooh, ooh. All of a sudden you heard this and I didn't like that experience and I even told him about it. I was like, dude, your kick drum is too long in that track, I think, because it's, it's like um, a standing wave, right? It's just this constant hum and nothing's exciting anymore because it's just like having feedback on a microphone but down at a low pitch. It's just this, this rumble. Nothing's exciting. It's just this tone. It's like being in a motorboat, you know, it's just, there's nothing fun about it. So that... Um, yeah, so that was that was a learning experience of where like yeah, you keep your kick drum short because even though his track sounded fine on headphones or in a smaller room, once you're in a big club, what happens? Well, these subs hype the low end usually, and there's propagation of this wave is going to go from if I'm the speaker over to you. There's going to be this wave, but it's also going to bounce off these walls and it's going to it's going to exist for longer than it existed in your audio file, right? As the reverb from the low frequencies are casting out. So even if you have a short kick drum, say an eighth note, half the time, right? Uh, if you have an eighth note kick drum, you might be hearing that kick drum for almost up to the quarter note with this reverberation, depending on how big the space is. So yeah, keeping your kick drum short actually allows the next kick drum event to be exciting again. Uh, so that's kind of the reasoning there. Uh, the bass, obviously, is, is also sharing the low end with the kick drum. So my, my like, kind of like vague rule of thumb would be if it's a house track, like I said earlier, you can have a kick drum that's big or a bass that's big, but not both. If it's a house track, I let the kick drum be the big thing. That, I, that's like the metronome. It's the timekeeper. It's this thing that's pounding you rhythmically. The bass is more of the syncopated, off the beat thing that's sort of more like, oh, hey, I'm up here, I'm over here. So it can be more of a mid-range thing, right? It's not trying to kick your butt down on the low end, shake your rib cage, right? Dubstep is kind of the opposite, right? With dubstep, you want this big bass that's just like, whoa, this massive thing's like overwhelming you and it's like moving and you're really getting this low end from the bass instrument. The kick drum, not so much. It's not necessary to be like, boom. It doesn't need to do that. But in both these genres of music, you want, nobody wants a small bass sound, right? No one wants a small kick drum. So there's techniques you can use that are psychoacoustic, essentially, ways that you can give the effect and impression of something being big without actually being big in the low frequencies. So an example for like a kick with dubstep would be a lot of verb. And sure enough, that's what a lot of people do with their, their kicks in dubstep, right? This big hall reverb on it. It doesn't have to be this low end that's like really rumbly to experience what you picture as a, as a big kick drum. And it's such an effective technique, especially if your track starts with the kick, the bass hasn't come in yet. The brain calibrates itself to this kick drum as that's a big low end instrument, right? Because boom, 
boom, and it has this, push, this big haw. Then the actual bass sound comes in with real low frequencies, and you go, holy fuck, how did they get such a big bass sound? And it's like, well, it's not the bass sound isn't necessarily that big. If you heard it soloed, it would be a massive preset or whatever. It's not necessarily that big. It's the fact that you got in tune to what you thought a big bass sound was when you were actually starved of low frequencies. And then now when you actually hear something, it's like drinking after being in the desert or something. It's like, oh, okay, I like that. Um, and then, so then vice versa with like a more house kind of electro thing or whatever, what they very often do is to have a very buzzy bass sound. Um, so you're getting a lot of bigness from harmonics. Or if you look at like Benny Manassi's Satisfaction or something, right? like a classic electro tune. And, and it was like buzzy bass with side chain. So it's really pumping, which gives you the impression of just an overall loudness, right? Like the PA can't handle this because it's like pumping or whatever. And then it gives you, um, and then it's reverb, right? So same trick as with the kick on the dubstep, right? So now here's this reverb to make this thing again seem more like it's, it's big because it's coming from this big place in this big space. Um, so you don't need the low frequencies. If you look at, you know, if you listen to Benny Benassi's Satisfaction, high pass, right? Like the bass is high pass. There is the, the low instrument has no low end, right? And so uh, there's a little there, but not a lot. And then, um, and then similarly with a lot of kicks and some dubstep tracks, you can listen and you're like, oh, there's not actually much low end. It's more of a 120 hertz or something like that. There's more of a punch to the kick, but it's not really this 50 hertz or anything like that going on. That's saved aside. So, that's the rule, and if you decide otherwise, if you feel like, no, I want low end for my kick and I want low end for my bass, then techniques like side chaining um, are good where you say, I'm going to make it so every time that the low, the low end is there from the kick, the low end will go away from the bass. Because we really don't need these two sine waves down there in that low octave. There's just not, or the low couple octaves. They're not going to really ever be uh, perceived as two things. All you have is this one wave that's happening in the low end. So pick your poison, really. It could be from either. In fact, you could fool someone into thinking it's from the other instrument. Like, it doesn't really matter where it comes from uh, too much, but there's no reason to have two, so at least at any given time. So it's really more about, again, I mean, it's kind of the thing, like I was saying earlier, when I get a mix from someone, I can stop it in silence and just imagine. Imagine how you want the low end to be. If you can't imagine that, you can put a low-pass filter on your master, low-pass down to 120 hertz, so all you're hearing is the sub-frequencies of your mix. Listen to what's going on and go, is that what I would want coming out of the subs? Is that is that the best it can be? Or is there maybe, is there mud? Is it found, and is that what I want? Or maybe I want, how do I want people to be getting punched in the gut from the low frequencies?